You're watching Africa Business Weekly. We now take you on an editorial journey across sub-Saharan Africa and bring you some of the most impactful business stories across the region this week. I'm David Alabi. From monetary policy decisions in West Africa to the recovery of tourism in East Africa, we'll start off by setting our lenses first in South Africa with Tania as she gives us a run-through of the key stories in Southern Africa this week. Take it away, Tania. We'll start with an exciting story about the electric vehicle market in South Africa. Mercedes-Benz South Africa is seeing major demand for its luxury EVs, even during some of the worst power cuts in the history of the country. CNBC Africa's Fifi Peters spoke to Mark Rain, the co-CEO of Mercedes-Benz South Africa, to find out why local consumers are so EV optimistic. I always say that for the South African market in specific, uh, the prerequisites for the e-mobility revolution, if we can call it, are, are much better in place because in the South African context, a lot of consumers have looked at going off the grid, at looking at renewable energies, in particular solar, and then e-mobility makes so much more sense. So I always say 50% of our customers either have gone off the grid, the other 50% are looking at going off the grid. And this development has only kick-started in Europe, whereas in South Africa, this is already a, a daily norm, if you can say it that way. All right, so you uh, did uh, say earlier on that you've got a whole lot more of these EQ range cars coming to the country. Yeah. Where they're currently made? They are made in Germany, and the EQE, uh, EQS SUV is being produced in our production plant in Tuscaloosa in the US. Right, because I know that currently the C-Class, for instance, yeah. being made here in South Africa in East London, yeah. and I'm just wondering if, if there are plans at this stage perhaps to uh, do a lot more electric production in this country? I mean, is the environment supportive of such? Yeah, I mean, we've got a great legacy and history of producing cars, Mercedes-Benz cars, in the South African market, in East London. And just recently, we've reinvested into our production plant, 13 billion rand. Sure. And we produce a wide portfolio of cars, from our conventional internal combustion engines, a C200, for instance, to our plug-in hybrid models, which are already half a step towards fully electric vehicles. So the competence and the production plant itself is state of the art. So um, we're looking into the future and I think there are exciting things to come. Yeah, so so, so just uh, citing another headwind uh, mm -hmm. right now. So it's not only the uh, power challenges, yeah. uh, which I want to dig in um, a little further into. I, I actually, let's just do that now. Yeah. Because uh, with the power uh, situation, there's also concerns around the increase in uh, criminality that it mm -hmm. has uh, brought forth. You know when it's dark, yeah. and now you have to stop at a at a, at a garage to, to, to charge your car, and then you've got you know the thieves doing what they do, <laughs> uh, potentially using a crisis as an yeah. opportunity. Uh, your plan for charging stations, though, uh, what, what is that? And to what degree is the ESCOM situation right now impacting on it? I mean, I always say there need to be three prerequisites in place in the South African market to further drive the demand and drive that e-mobility revolution. It's price parity, meaning not um, giving the electric vehicles a disadvantage, charging infrastructure and a holistic approach to the ecosystem of e-mobility. And charging infrastructure is a key enabler for a wider audience to move into electric vehicles. And we've partnered up with um, grid cars, which are uh, the strongest partner in the South African market to provide uh, various forms of charging. Secondly, we also provide every Mercedes EQ customer with a free installation of a home charger or at any destination of choice. In that, bridging the gap and enabling people to charge their cars. But one other aspect is that charging in the South African context will only make sense, or electric vehicles will only make sense if you link it back to renewable energy and solar systems. Standard Chartered Bank recently released a report breaking down the financing needed to bring the African continent to a just transition. Earlier in the week, I spoke to Kweku Bedu Ado, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank Southern Africa, and started by asking the trillion dollar question, where will the money come from? Let's listen in. Personally, I think that there's there's need for a bit of patience because where will the money, where does the money come from? It comes from savings. Mm. It comes from perhaps uh, which the savings from households and, and, and economies ends up in in banking sector balance sheets and asset management balance sheets. So we also have to be mindful about that. And they also would have, obviously, their investment targets, their risk appetite, um, 
And then it could also come from government grants. Okay. Uh, so it takes time for all these things to, to settle and for funds to be allocated for the purposes for which um, emerging markets require these funds for climate adaptation. So my view is that it takes a bit of patience because hundred trillion dollars is not pocket change. It's it's a lot of money, albeit a big chunk of that money goes to two economies, China and India. But nevertheless, it, it is a lot of money, and I think it requires patience. It requires dialogue because the the source of that funding is from economies that are themselves going through a lot of challenge at the moment with energy crisis and with winter approaching and high cost of fuel dealing with inflation, um, it calls for a bit of patience and additional dialogue, I think. Yeah, and also innovation, right? I mean, we hear a lot of talk about innovative financing solutions, specifically for the just transition. How can we increase this, but also increase the private sector involvement locally? I think the, the whole climate change and the consequences, something that it affects everyone on the globe. Um, so it requires involvement by everyone, governments and private sector alike. Um, we're asking for close to a hundred trillion dollars. Um, I don't know if all of it can be raised from international investors. Obviously, some of it has to be raised domestically. What the report is pointing out that if we require domestic economies to raise those funds exclusively, it will be at the expense of um, household welfare in terms of depressed consumption. And obviously, depressed consumption means uh, reduced welfare. So it, I think what the report highlights is, is the range, the two extremes. If it's all funded by the international community versus if it's all funded by uh, the domestic economies, respective domestic economies in the emerging markets, where does I think the answer lies somewhere in between. And again, it calls for some compromises, some dialogue, and you know, facing the practical realities around the world and a bit more patience from everyone. The important thing is to get onto that agenda. And with climate adaptation, which is what is really required across Africa, I think there are steps that African governments can can initiate on their own without waiting for external funding to come through. And that's it from me. Back to you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Now let's move over to East Africa as Fiona takes us through stories that shaped headlines this week. In Kenya, Safaricom's Fuliza has cut daily charges for loans below 1,000 Kenyan shillings by 40% and introduced a three-day grace period. Borrowings from the service rose by 30.7% in the six months to June this year. James Wajangi, a principal consultant at Iricon Limited, unpacks more for us. What we've seen today at Norfolk Hotel is um, NCPBA, uh, KCB and Safaricom coming together to announce that they will be providing a 40% reduction on daily charges for Fuliza loans that are below uh, 1,000 Kenya shillings. And they will also be introducing a three-day grace period um, for these loans, and this is with effect from the 1st of October. So... What that means is that any charges um, or any loans that you take through Fuliza that are up to a thousand will come down from what was uh, Kenya 10 shillings to about six shillings. Uh, and what is key to note is that the 1% access fee for all borrowings has still been retained. Yeah, I mean, James, since January 2019, when uh, Fudiza was uh, officially rolled out, it has become a crucial part of many Kenyans. Just looking at this announcement, then to what extent will this uh, potentially affect the already ballooning culture of um, getting debt from Fudiza? I would imagine, Fiona, this is actually going to increase uh, this uh, borrowing uh, from from uh, Fuliza users and from people perhaps who were not able to borrow because they were 
uh, and happy about the charges. Uh, imagine with me that uh, you know we borrow 1.6 billion Kenya shillings a day, and now we've uh, made it even easier to borrow uh, because we've reduced the fees. Uh, what this means for the consumer is that the consumer will be borrowing more. What it means for M-Pesa is that if you look at M-Pesa's year-on-year um, revenues, especially for M-Pesa, the uh, the specific financial services sector, because they've divided them into different sectors, has moved from 3% of their total revenue to 88 in 2021. What that is telling you is that, and that has been largely driven by Fuliza loans. And that tells you that even this partnership that they have uh, for the overdraft, overdraft facility that we're calling Fuliza, tells you that it's going to grow even larger. And uh, you, you can see uh, NFI and non-funded income uh, for both uh, NCBA and KCB, you will see that increase dramatically in their next reporting period. Also from the region, tourism in Rwanda recovered at the rate of 80% in the first half of 2022, driven mainly by gorilla tourism. We spoke to Ricard Wigamba, the country director at Mastercard Foundation, on how to rethink tourism. Rethinking tourism is quite um, a great theme for this year, uh, especially when you think about what has happened over the last two years with the pandemic. I think the pandemic, as we know, was um, devastating in all sectors, but especially in the tourism hospitality sector. You know, with travel stopped, uh, with, uh, you know, with airlines or even, you know, hotels, restaurants and others basically were not functioning. And I think uh, what this taught us is a lot of things. And one of them is how do we sell tourism? Uh, meaning how do we use digital platforms, how do we manage to still uh, be at the front of the travelers so that even though they're not able to travel, but at least they're able to hear about the opportunities that exist. Uh, we thinking tourism is also thinking about our own domestic market. Um, you know, even when lockdowns were um, kind of eased um, and international travel wasn't happening, the locals could travel. And so um, thinking about are we providing for products that are responding to the needs of the domestic travelers. So we think in tourism is all these things. And I think this is really a time for us not to forget um, what we've learned through the, the pandemic, which is still here, uh, but also how do we ensure that we have businesses that are resilient and um, ready for other shocks. Um, you know, and so I think there's so much that we've learned and the idea of celebrating this year uh, by thinking about what this tourism of the future looks like is, is quite the right theme for the year. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the future of tourism because as we talk about tourism recovery, uh, Rwanda in the first half of this year, uh, recovery of tourism was around 80 percent. You know, we're getting closer to 100 percent. What do you think is going to be oh, the role of public private partnership in the sense of building resilient businesses? A public-private sector partnership is going to be critical. Um, in fact, I'd like to even uh, take us to what we saw happening even as you know the pandemic was still there and we were able to um, work with the public and the private sector and how they were able to work in the case of Rwanda. We know of the Basketball Africa League that happened really at a time where the pandemic uh, to some extent was still happening. Why was that possible? That was possible because of the high rate of vaccination. And I think, uh, you know, that's, that's important to be able to say that, you know, when uh, shocks like this happen and the government provides an environment where travelers are safe, um, you know, which is really what happened, we were able to open uh, to the world because the Rwandan citizens were safe and by in that measure also making the travelers safe coming into the country. And that was already something that we can count as a public-private partnership to allow for businesses to continue to function by making them be safe, 
having the vaccination, the testing, and I think that was already that. As we think about rethinking tourism and going forward, absolutely that partnership needs to continue. In the case of Rwanda, we've seen a lot of investment uh, that have been made by the government. Uh, the BK Arena, for example, uh, which is what has enabled, um, you know, tournaments like the Basketball League, um, you know, uh, Afri Afro Basket and, and other games are coming into the country. And there's a lot of work that is also being done from an infrastructure perspective, sports in this case. So that's just one example. But also the work that we've seen with brand uh, Rwanda, made in Rwanda, I think is something that uh, is aligned to the strategy, the national strategy of transformation of, of the country and, and the manufacturing sector. And I think building on, on that, on that environment, um, on ease of doing business, which the government provides, and then having the private sector to actually now invest into this is going to be critical. And how do they invest? Uh, today we've heard uh, young entrepreneurs talking about some of the challenges they face, um, access to finance being critical, our financial service providers being able to bet on businesses that are innovative, you know, and not just uh, business as usual, uh, the creatives. Um, you know, young people who are thinking of having, um, you know, a career in the digital space, um, you know, and, and so being open to such innovations that are really the value chains of, of, of tourism is going to be critical. So financing the entrepreneurs in the middle and then leveraging the infrastructure and other um, investments that the government has made. Public-private partnership is critical. These are some of the stories coming in from East Africa this week. Thank you so much, Fiona. Now from West Africa, we have had quite an eventful week, a surprise 150 basis point rate hike in the policy rate and a 5% increase in the cash reserve requirement for banks are ways the central bank of Nigeria is deploying to rein in inflation in the country, which has risen by 280 basis points in the past four months to cross the 20% mark. Now, the CBN governor, Godwin Emufili, says all Nigerian banks must fund their accounts by Thursday for the anticipated CRR debit, and banks may also be precluded from the FX market. Committee's decision. Members deliberated on the impact of the widening margin between the current policy rate of 14% and the inflation rate of 20.52%. At this meeting, the, the option was... Option to losing the policy rate was not considered as this would be, a, would be gravely detrimental to reining in inflation. The committee thus agreed unanimously to raise the policy rate to narrow the negative real interest rate and re, narrow interest rate gap and rein in inflation. The committee does thus voted unanimously to raise the NPR. Ten members voted to raise the NPR by 150 basis points. One by 100 basis points and one by 50 basis points. Ten members voted to increase CRR by 500, 500 basis points, while two members voted to increase it by 750 basis points. In summary, the MPC voted to one, raise the NPR to 15.5%, 15 15 retain the asymmetric corridor at plus 100 and minus 700 basis points around the NPR, increase the cash reserve requirement ratio, CRR, to a minimum of 32.5% and for retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. We expect that all the banks in Nigeria must fund their account by Thursday, 48 hours because we will debit them for CRR. We will take their CRR to a minimum of 32.5%. So which means we are going to take liquidity out of their vaults by Thursday. If any bank fails to meet up with this expectation, the decision of the MPC is that we should, we, we, we may need to, let me use me, we may need to preclude those banks from foreign exchange market for on Friday and onward until they meet this 32.5. This message is meant to underscore the fact that NPC says this decision, this very aggressive decision to, to rein in inflation must yield result. 
Tilewa Adebajo, the Chief Executive Officer of CFG Advisory, and Lawrence Hams, the Head of Africa Trading at Rand Merchant Bank, share their thoughts on the decisions. I wasn't quite surprised with the rate hike at about 150 basis points. I think um, considering the uh, issues of inflation at runaway levels, um, you know, that wasn't too much of a surprise. I think what actually took me by surprise was the uh, the crash reserve ratio, which went from 27.5 to 32.5. Um, considering the fact that you have over 50 trillion in deposits now, 25%, um, uh, sorry, 25, 30% of that 50 trillion is close to about 17 trillion, 32.5, 17 trillion that's going to be mopped up. And don't forget that in April, 10 banks were debited 7.2 trillion to be able to meet up with their cash reserve requirements. So the big elephant in the room is that while you might be sterilizing with cash reserve requirements and some special notes, we still have the ways and means financing of 25 trillion out there or more. So it seems to me that while you're taking this money out from the banking system, you're pushing it out through to government by ways and means. And I think that is really what is driving inflation. Because in Nigeria, our inflation is not on aggregate demand. Most of our inflation and even the inflation now is what you will look at as cost push. The central bank governor also mentioned the issue of energy prices with diesel, food inflation. Those are the key drivers of inflation. When you add the ways and means financing to this, then you can begin to see the triggers of runaway inflation. So it's important that they address this issue of the ways and means financing currently at close to 25 trillion. And let's ensure that the CRR debits are not being used to finance the ways and means. Otherwise, the net gain will be zero. Mm, quite a lot said there. But Lawrence, let me get your first reaction as well, and more or less uh, the implications for banks on, on that CRR um, increase by 5%. Yeah, certainly a lot more aggressive than than, than we were expecting. Um, look on the interest rate side, I think the NPR still it's a it's a policy tool that that the transmission mechanism is not yet fully orthodox, and the feed through is not as as well um, transmitted as in other economies. But I think uh, the CRR certainly. I think, like I mentioned before, the MPC. I think there's still a lot of liquidity in the system, and we see that through asset prices, which are quite inflated. If you look at um, OMO, OMO and T-bill yields are still single digits. Um, so the spread between kind of local currency assets and uh, dollar dollar instruments is 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 tightening quite a bit. Um, so I think this will go a long way uh, towards starting to make asset prices uh, more attractive. I think this. There's definitely um, an implication for banks in the sense that um, it's, a, it's a huge amount of liquidity that has to flow out. I think there's, we will probably see the shortening of the curve aggressively kick higher. Um, the one thing that I found interesting is that uh, for a central bank that's been quite fixated on, on NAFX and FX rates, uh, they didn't really make any mention of that throughout the, the MPC statement. Um, so it's, it speaks to, I think, the fact that they're looking towards to more, to move in, in time towards a more orthodox um, monetary, monetary policy through uh, NPR rate, et cetera, um, that, which was a focus. They were really focused on the rate side of the equation and, and didn't make a lot of mention on the FX side. So that was just interesting. I think um, the tightening of liquidity definitely speaks to the fact that they're looking to take speculative demand out the market and that should potentially weigh on the on the spread between official rates mm. and um, parallel market. Okay. Um, so interesting, I think. All right, uh, talking about that that that, uh, um, that uh, spread more, more or less, I'd like you to speak more or less on what we saw. Uh, yes, the hike has been made, but uh, we still have that significant distance between the NPR and uh, uh, inflation. Inflation at 20.5% uh, for August, and the NPR now at 15.5%. Yes, it's, I mean, but with inflation at 20.5%, it's very difficult to move that rate from 14 above 20% to be able to make real rates positive. That would be the ideal situation. But that kind of hike will cause a very significant shock to the system. Um, 
But I think let's talk about what Lawrence has said in the sense that we haven't addressed the issue of the foreign exchange. There's now a 65% spread between the official rate and the parallel market rate. And that is as a result of multiplicity of windows that the central bank has. Um, if you're trying to control that, as he said, that you don't want excess liquidity to be chasing foreign exchange, what are the alternative in investment assets? He's talked about the OMO yields and the T-bill yields not being competitive for investment purposes or returning negative yields in essence. So in terms of investment class, investors are not finding anywhere to put their funds. And the interest rates the banks are offering on your deposits is way below the level of inflation. So the challenge we have when you have stagflation is the fact that you need to make some radical moves. And unfortunately, like I've said earlier, the key, the big elephant in the room is the ways and means financing and the fiscal issues we have in Nigeria today. Revenue uh, cannot even service debt repayments. You're increasing interest rates. The impact on that is that the federal government debt payment is going to go higher mm -hmm. by another one, uh, uh, 150 basis points. So debt servicing is going to become more expensive for the government. But again, central bank is going to go back to its fallback position of trying to maintain financial stability and raise rates. So orthodox move, but the issues in the foreign exchange market with a 65% differential and of course the ways and means financing needs to be addressed. And on that note, it's an end to this week's edition of Business Weekly. And a big thanks to Tanya and Fiona for the regional updates there. I'm David Alabi. We'll be back same time next week for more weekly business stories across sub-Saharan Africa. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now.